Growing up, the factory was just another member of our family, its hum and buzz as familiar as any relative's voice. Dad started it when I was just a toddler, building it from scratch into a name that every local grocery store wanted on their shelves. After he passed, it was up to me and my brother David to keep the wheels turning. Gina, you ready to step up? This isn't kid stuff, David had said on the day we took over. He was older by just three years, but sometimes he acted like a gruff old man. Yeah, I've been ready, I shot back, more confident than I felt. David had always been the face of the business, dealing with suppliers and buyers, while I was comfortable in the background, handling the team and making sure everyone was where they needed to be. We worked well together, our skills complementing each other. Things at the factory were running smoother than ever, but personal life, that was another story. I wasn't exactly social, preferring quiet evenings at home over parties or networking events. That changed when I met Tom. I remember that night clearly. It was one of those rare occasions I let David drag me to a business mixer. I was nursing a drink at the bar, planning my escape, when Tom sidled up beside me. You look about as thrilled to be here as I am, he said, flashing a grin that caught me off guard. I'm just here so my brother stops nagging about my hermit lifestyle, I replied, surprised at my own honesty. Ah, siblings can be like that. I'm Tom, by the way, he said, extending his hand. Gina, I shook his hand, his grip, confident, but not overpowering. Tom was a journalist, writing about the local business scene, which apparently included my family's cookie empire. He was clever, using his charm and wit to weave through topics, from mundane to personal. Before I knew it, I was laughing more freely than I had in months. You really should let me write a piece on you. The air is behind the cookies or something like that. Tom joked, or at least I thought he was joking. Let's not, I said, more sharply than I intended. I prefer keeping my life out of the papers. Fair enough, he nodded, not pushing further, which I appreciated. Despite my initial resistance, Tom was persistent. He sent me messages, light and teasing at first, gradually becoming more frequent and personal. I found myself waiting for them, eager for the distraction from the everyday stress of business. David noticed the change in me. One evening, as we were closing up the office, he cornered me about it. Who's the guy, he asked bluntly. What guy? I tried to keep my face neutral. Don't play dumb. You've been smiling at your phone like it's a love letter. Spill it. It's Tom, the journalist from the mixer. We've been talking. I admitted, bracing for his reaction. David frowned, his protective instincts flaring up. Just be careful, Gina. Guys like him, they can smell money and opportunity. Six months later, I was walking down the aisle toward Tom, my heart full of hope for the future. The prenup was David's idea, and though Tom was not thrilled, he signed it. It was just a piece of paper, I told myself, a precaution that we'd never need. I believed in us, in the promise of what we could be together. Life with Tom started like a whirlwind. Suddenly, I was part of a glamorous world, often at arm's length with photographers snapping our pictures as we attended high-profile events. Tom thrived in the spotlight, using every outing as a chance to boost his online presence. One evening, as we were getting ready for another big gala, Tom was fussing more than usual. He held up two ties, a silver and a blue one, turning to me. Which one? The silver is flashy, good for photos. But the blue, it pops on camera, he pondered out loud, genuinely torn. Go with the blue, it suits you better, I said, keeping it simple, my mind more on the comfort of my heels than his tie color. Tom nodded and went with the blue, but not before taking a few selfies in the mirror. He posted them on his blog, with the caption, Which tie? Help me choose. He smiled at his phone as responses flooded in. At these events, I felt out of place. While Tom schmoozed, I often found myself tucked away in a corner, observing the crowd rather than being part of it. He would come over, every so often, to check on me, each time a bit more animated as the wine flowed. Gina, you should try mingling a bit. People are dying to know more about the woman behind the cookie empire.
Tom nudged one night, his speech slightly slurred. I nodded, not wanting to argue. It was his night, after all. As he walked away, I overheard him telling someone about his expansive lifestyle that our marriage had apparently granted him. It irked me how he spun our life together into content for public consumption. As the months rolled on, the pattern continued. Tom's blog grew, fueled by the snippets of our life he broadcasted. I became more reclusive, retreating into the sanctuary of my work at the factory. The cookie business was booming, and I threw myself into it, finding solace in the familiar chaos of production lines and staff meetings. David noticed the change in me. During one of our late-night check-ins at the factory, he leaned against a packing machine, a concerned look on his face. You've been quiet. Everything okay with Tom? He asked, his voice cutting through the noise of the warehouse. It's fine. Just the usual ups and downs. I shrugged, not wanting to admit how strained things had become. Gina, remember what I said. Money changes people. Be careful, David warned, his tone serious. I know. David. I'm keeping my eyes open. I reassured him, though I felt anything but reassured. As I drove home that night, the factory's lights fading in my rearview mirror, I couldn't shake the feeling that the glamorous life Tom so loved was more of a facade, and I was trapped behind it, playing a part one never auditioned for. We worked well like that, but when the need for a new finance director came up, it fell on me to find the right fit. That's how Emily came into the picture. She was sharp and had a knack for numbers that impressed even David, which wasn't easy. Soon enough, she was not just crunching numbers at work, but also a regular at our home during the late-night strategy sessions David and I held. Tom usually just hovered around these meetings, glass of wine in hand, barely hiding his boredom. He never really got the business, nor did he try to. But with Emily's arrival, there was a shift. I noticed how his eyes followed her around, lighting up whenever she spoke about financial forecasts or new funding strategies. However, Tom's interest seemed more personal than professional. I brushed it off initially, chalking it up to his usual charm. He always did enjoy charming intelligent women, and Emily fit that bill. Yet, something in my gut twisted a bit each time I saw them laughing together a little too closely for comfort. One evening, after Emily had left and Tom was in his study supposedly working on an article, I decided to clear the air. Tom, got a sec? I leaned on the doorframe of his study, watching him stare at his screen. He glanced up, a little startled. Sure, what's up? It's about Emily. You guys seem to be hitting it off. I said, trying to keep my tone neutral but firm. Tom raised an eyebrow, his fingers pausing over the keyboard. What do you mean? We're just talking shop. You know, business. Yeah, I get that. Just seems like you're really into those conversations. Just making sure it's all it is. I pushed, needing to hear him say it. He chuckled, a bit too casually. Gina, you're worrying about nothing. She's smart, got good ideas. That's all I'm interested in. As Tom went back to his typing, I couldn't shake off the discomfort. His reassurances did little to suit the doubts creeping up on me. I found myself confiding in David more than ever during our late-night sessions after Emily and the other staff had left. Everything okay with you and Tom? David asked one night as we reviewed some shipment schedules. It's fine. He's busy with his trips, and I'm here with the cookies. I shrugged, trying to sound nonchalant. David frowned, not buying it. You know I don't like that guy much. Always thought he was a bit slick. Just watch yourself, Gina. I am, David. Thanks, I said, grateful for his concern, but feeling the weight of my marital woes grow heavier. Despite this, life at home and work kept marching on. Tom's travels for whatever stories he was chasing became more frequent, and oddly enough, I was relieved. His trips meant fewer awkward dinners and less tension about him and Emily. I focused on the company, pushing those nagging thoughts aside. The factory was gearing up for a major expansion, and I threw myself into the work. The company was celebrating a record-breaking quarter, and David and I decided to throw a big party for the whole team. The venue was decked out, the music was lively, 
and the air was buzzing with laughter and chatter. Tom was there too, of course. He had his phone out, capturing everything for his blog. This is going to be great content, he'd said, winking at me as he filmed the decorations and the crowd. I forced a smile, still uneasy about broadcasting our personal lives. As the party went on, I needed a break from the noise and slipped out to the quieter foyer. That's when I heard them, whispers that weren't meant for my ears. Curiosity peaked, I edged closer to the partition, my heart pounding in my chest. There was Tom in a far too intimate embrace with Emily. The sight knocked the wind out of me, but it was their words that cut deeper. Just wait till Gina's money hits our account. We'll be out of here, away to our dream house abroad, Tom whispered, his voice thick with greed and deception. Emily giggled, her voice tinged with contempt. Can you believe how clueless she is? What a stupid chicken. The room spun as their laughter pierced through me. They were using me, mocking me. The pain was sharp, raw, and it burned through my shock. I stood frozen, the urge to confront them wrestling with the need to protect what was left of my dignity. I chose the latter, stepping back into the shadows before they could see me. My mind raced as I walked back to the main hall. I needed support, I needed David. I found him chatting with a group of employees, his laughter a stark contrast to the turmoil inside me. Pulling him aside, I whispered urgently, David, we need to talk. Now. His face fell as he saw my expression. We found a quiet corner, and I poured out everything. The affair, the plans, their cruel words. David's face hardened with each word, his protective fury barely contained. That son of a, David's hands balled into fists. And Emily? I can't believe she'd do this. We need to be smart, David. We can't let them destroy everything we've built. I said, my voice shaky but resolute. You're right. We'll get the auditors on this first thing tomorrow. And a detective. We'll do this quietly, gather all the evidence we need to nail them both. David said, his tone ice cold. The rest of the night was a blur. I went through the motions, smiling and chatting, while inside, a storm raged. Tom came up to me several times, oblivious to the fact that I knew everything. Each time, it took all my strength not to reveal anything. The morning after the party, I was at the office early. David had arranged everything by the time I arrived. They'll be here in an hour. I've told them it's a routine check, nothing to raise suspicions, he informed me as I stepped into his office. Good, we can't tip them off. Not yet, I replied, trying to steady my nerves. The auditors were thorough. They set up in one of the conference rooms, with stacks of financial statements, invoices, and bank records. I tried to focus on my work, but my mind kept drifting to the auditors and what they might find. Around mid-afternoon, one of the auditors called us into the conference room. We need to discuss our preliminary findings, he said, his expression grave. The room felt suddenly too small, the air too tight. What is it? David asked, his voice tense. The lead auditor spread out several documents on the table. We found numerous irregular transactions. Large sums have been transferred to an external account over the past few months. Here, and here. He pointed to the highlighted lines on a bank statement. I felt a chill run down my spine. Whose account? I managed to ask, bracing myself for the answer. It's registered under Thomas Landon. The auditor replied, looking from me to David. My worst fears confirmed, I fought to keep my composure. What about any links to Emily Rogers? I asked, my voice barely a whisper. We're still looking into that, but given the patterns, it's likely we'll find a connection, the auditor answered. The next few days were a blur of meetings with lawyers and more sessions with the auditors. Each new piece of evidence was a stab in the heart, but also a building block towards the fortress of my revenge. I knew I had to be strong, for myself and for our family's company. As the auditors wrapped up their investigation, the private detective David had hired came in with his findings. He laid out photographs and receipts on David's desk, pictures of Tom buying a luxury car and expensive jewelry, not for me but for Emily. 
And there's more, the detective said grimly. They booked tickets to Mexico, four months from now. Looks like they plan to drain your accounts and run. David and I exchanged a glance, the final pieces clicking into place. He's also signed a contract with a major media company in Mexico, the detective added. The betrayal was deeper than I had imagined. Not only was Tom stealing from me, but he was also planning a whole new life with Emily, funded by the money he took from my company. Armed with this information, we finalized our plan. Legal and financial traps were set quietly, ensuring that when Tom and Emily tried to make their move, they'd find themselves with nowhere to go. The end of the year was approaching, and it brought with it the perfect opportunity to set my plan into motion. I decided to host a pre-Christmas celebration for the company. It was an annual event, typically a time for cheer and toasts, but this year, it was the stage for my carefully crafted retribution. The venue was a well-known restaurant, beautifully decorated with twinkling lights and festive garlands. Employees milled around, laughing and chatting, completely unaware of the drama about to unfold. Tom arrived, looking as dashing as ever and completely oblivious to my plans. He went straight to work, filming the decorations and guests, broadcasting live to his blog followers. Looking stunning, babe, Tom said, coming over to give me a quick peck on the cheek before returning to his video. Thanks, Tom. Make sure you get good shots. I said, my tone light, masking the storm inside. The evening progressed smoothly, and after dinner, it was time for the main event. I took the stage to give the annual awards to the employees. This was it. My heart was pounding as I called Emily up first. Let's hear it for Emily Rogers, everyone. This year's standout employee. I announced, my voice steady as applause filled the room. Emily beamed as she walked up clearly pleased by the recognition. I handed her a beautifully wrapped gift box. Open it later, I whispered, and she nodded, oblivious to the trap. After a few more awards, it was Tom's turn. I saved him for last, making sure the cameras were still rolling. And now, for a special recognition. Tom, could you join me up here? I called out, my voice echoing through the room. Tom looked surprised but pleased as he made his way to the stage. What's this about, he whispered, as he joined me under the spotlight. Just a little something to show my appreciation, I said, handing him a similar gift box. Why don't you open it now, for everyone to see? Tom, ever the performer, played up his curiosity for the cameras, tearing into the wrapping paper. The moment the contents were revealed, his face went white. Divorce papers and photos of him with Emily. The room fell silent, all eyes on Tom. His mouth opened and closed, but no words came out. He looked around, desperate, but there was no escape. And Emily, why don't you open your gift now too? I called out, my voice clear and strong. With shaky hands, Emily opened her box, pulling out receipts for the car Tom bought her, along with bank statements detailing the stolen money. Tom, usually so composed and confident, stood frozen. The live cameras, still broadcasting to his blog, captured every moment of his disgrace. There was nowhere for him to hide, no narrative he could spin that would undo the truth laid bare before his audience. I took a deep breath and addressed the room. Ladies and gentlemen, what you're witnessing tonight is not just a revelation but a betrayal of the worst kind. I began, my voice steady but charged with emotion. For years, this man, I pointed to Tom, and his accomplice, my gaze shifted to Emily, have been siphoning funds from our company. They planned to flee to Mexico, thinking they could escape the consequences of their actions. The silence was palpable, the crowd hanging on every word. Tom, regaining some of his wits, blurted out in a desperate attempt to deflect the blame. It was all her idea. She seduced me into doing this. The accusation seemed to snap Emily out of her shock. She stormed onto the stage, her face contorted with rage. You liar. You came to me with the plan. You said we'd be free and rich. She lunged at him, her hands flying as she slapped and scratched, her voice piercing the stunned silence. The scuffle on stage was chaotic, with Tom trying to deflect Emily's blows and defend himself, 
both verbally and physically. The spectacle was not just being recorded but streamed live, drawing a massive online audience. David came up beside me, placing a reassuring hand on my shoulder. He then stepped forward, his voice booming over the microphone, cutting through the cacophony. Enough, he shouted. The police are already on their way. Both of you will face charges for fraud and theft. The evidence is overwhelming, and justice will be served. The police arrived minutes later, their entrance adding to the drama. They separated Emily and Tom, handcuffing them amidst the flash of cameras and the murmur of the shocked employees. This whole ordeal, broadcasted live, was a spectacle no one could have anticipated, drawing viewers from all over. As the police led them away, the room burst into whispers and murmurs, the employees processing the night's shocking events. I stood there, amidst the chaos, feeling a mix of relief and profound sadness. What had started as a festive celebration had turned into a public unveiling of betrayal. The live feed was still running, and I realized the camera was focused on me. Gathering my composure, I addressed the audience directly. Thank you for your support. Tonight was about bringing the truth to light, no matter how painful. We will rebuild, and we will emerge stronger. The support was immediate and overwhelming. Comments poured in, messages of solidarity and encouragement flooding the live feed. People praised my courage and even suggested I start my own blog to share my side of the story. David squeezed my shoulder. You did what you had to do, Gina. It's over now. But as I looked around at the remnants of the evening, the decorations that now seemed garish, the empty stage that had just hosted a confrontation, I knew it wasn't over. This was just the end of a chapter. There was much to do, relationships to mend, and a company to heal. I filed for divorce immediately and sued Tom for the financial havoc he'd wreaked through his deceit and fraud. The court ruled in my favor, and Tom was ordered to pay a hefty sum in compensation, money that would help stabilize the company's finances and ensure our employees didn't suffer because of his greed. Emily's fate was sealed in court, she was convicted of embezzlement, had to return all the stolen funds, and lost her financial license. The industry ban was the final nail in her professional coffin. Meanwhile, Tom's life unraveled spectacularly. The Mexican media company he'd planned to escape to terminated his contract when they caught wind of his criminal activities. No one else wanted to touch him, his reputation toxic and his professional network crumbled. His followers abandoned him, disgusted by his actions, forcing him to shut down his blog. One afternoon, as I was reviewing the quarterly performance reports in my office, Tom showed up unannounced. He looked defeated, a shadow of the man he once was. Gina, I... I'm so sorry. Can we talk? His voice was shaky, his eyes not meeting mine. I stood firm, the memories of his betrayal, still fresh. There's nothing to talk about, Tom. You should leave. I said sternly. Please, Gina. I've lost everything. I just need a chance to explain. He pleaded, taking a step closer. I didn't budge. You had your chances, Tom. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a business to run. Without waiting for his response, I called security. Please escort Mr. Landon out. He was just leaving. Watching him being led away, I felt a chapter firmly closing behind me. I turned back to my desk, where the future lay, a future that was looking brighter each day. David came into my office, having heard about Tom's attempt to see me. You okay? He asked, looking concerned. I'm fine, David. Better than fine, actually. I replied, a genuine smile spreading across my face. It's over, and I'm ready to move forward. That's the spirit, David said with a grin. Speaking of moving forward, how's the blog idea coming along? I nodded enthusiastically. Actually, I'm thinking bigger. A video blog, or vlog to connect directly with our customers and share our journey. Transparency, recovery, innovation, you know, make it a platform for dialogue. David's eyes lit up. Brilliant idea. It puts a face to the name, makes it personal. Let's not just bounce back, let's leap forward. 
As the vlog took shape, I felt a renewed sense of purpose. I was not just rebuilding a company, I was creating a community. Each video we posted built more engagement, more support. People appreciated the honesty and the efforts we were making to ensure such betrayals never happened again.